ships have the incredibly bad habit of occasionally sinking. Now, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, oh boy. Since humankind first set out upon the waves, they've been battling with this uncomfortable fact to varying degrees of success. Nowadays, shipbuilding and navigation is such that maritime disasters are extremely rare, but for centuries, hundreds and hundreds, no, thousands of ships sank for one reason or another. In fact, it's thought that there are at least three million wrecks down there on the bottom of the world's oceans. So, why do ships sink? Well, because water gets in them, I'm sure the witty ones among you would like to say, and you are correct, but the actual physics involved are fascinating, and the variety of factors that influence how and why ships sink is well worth a look. Today, we'll look at the physics behind the sinking of ships, and the various unsettling ways through history that different ships have sunk from the glaringly obvious reasons to the subtle and lesser known. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today, let's answer the question, how and why do ships sink? We're all familiar with the dramatic side of a sinking ship because, unfortunately, and even in recent history, some have been lost in dramatic ways. We've done a couple of videos now on this channel of ships that were captured on film sinking, but it's interesting to actually examine the complexities of what's going on inside as this is happening. See, ships are massive, surprise surprise, they're complicated machines that are sometimes the size of a small floating town with hundreds and hundreds of cabins, bulkheads, shafts, voids, tanks, all kinds of weird and wonderful structures inside. Now, coupled with the fact that these things can weigh hundreds of thousands of tons, it's a miracle they float at all. But our old friend Archimedes outlined, back in the ancient world, that ships should float regardless of their size, thanks to a little thing known today, creatively, as the Archimedes Principle. Now, this is to do with something called displacement and buoyancy. It basically says that boats and ships can float, even though they weigh hundreds and thousands of tons because they displace a perfectly equal amount of weight. It's a fancy way of saying that when you put something in the water, or any fluid, it gets a little push back from the water that helps it float in the first place. This push back is called buoyant force. Imagine you jump into a full bathtub, and of course, water would spill out. Now the amount of water that splashes out is actually the same amount of space that you would take up in the tub. Archimedes discovered that when you put something in water, it pushes aside or displaces the same amount of water as the size of the thing. Now this displaced water creates the buoyant force that pushes back up. Say for example, you've built a ship like Titanic that weighs all up about 52,000 tons. Well then your ship is going to displace 52,000 tons of water with an equal force pushing up against it. Now this equilibrium is what keeps everything in balance and your ship above water. Archimedes' principle helps us understand why some things float while others sink. It's all about the relationship between the weight of the object and the weight of the water it displaces. If an object can displace enough water to equal its weight before it's completely submerged, it floats. If not, it's a one-way ticket to the bottom of the proverbial tub. It's a dance between the weight of the object and the water that it pushes aside. So now that we understand the delicate balance at play here, then you can begin to imagine that upsetting that balance in one direction could result in a sinking. A ship in water cannot change its weight much. Sure, things can be tossed overboard like loose cargo and the like, but the ship's very structure, its heavy and powerful engines and all those thousands and thousands of tons of steel used to make up its skeleton are very much fixed in place. Ships rely on their watertight, lightweight skins, or the outer shell plating, to keep all that water out, because once water starts to get in, then that careful balance is thrown out of whack. If the watertight shell plating is punctured or holed, then things can get nasty, and here's where Archimedes' principle comes into play again, but this time in reverse. Water, if allowed, starts rushing into the ship through the openings. Now as this happens, the ship's critical buoyant force begins to decrease, because the parts of it inside that are not flooded yet slowly become fewer and fewer as the flooding spreads. Crucially, the weight of the ship has changed in that the flooded parts are now just dead weight with hundreds of thousands of tons of water added for extra measure, but now there's less buoyant force to keep it all afloat. The balancing act 
is totally out of whack. As more water floods in, the ship gets heavier and heavier but can't displace enough water to support this increasing weight. Eventually, the weight of the ship exceeds the buoyant force pushing it up, leading to the ship totally sinking. It sounds simple enough, but out on the open ocean there are infinite possibilities and random factors that can totally change the reason a ship takes on water and, ultimately, how it sinks. The reason for ships actually taking on enough water that they lose their buoyant force are way too long to even begin to list totally on this video, but let's try and look at a few historical examples of note. The first and most obvious way of getting water into your ship is to puncture the shell plating and lose that critical watertight seal. Ships from history naturally took on a certain amount of water known as bilge water, usually from gaps in seams on wooden sailing ships or from the decks above. Now this wasn't usually an issue because it could just be pumped out through the voyage, it simply wasn't enough water to overwhelm the buoyancy and sink the ship. What was a significant flooding event though was that famously experienced by the ocean liner Titanic in 1912 when a brush with its iceberg opened up a series of relatively thin, long openings in the hull along the seams of the ship's steel plates. It didn't take much. At the time, the inquiries thought that an uninterrupted 300 foot gash must have been torn open, but something that large would actually have caused the ship to sink in minutes. Today it's thought that the openings equated to just a total amount of about 12 square feet, or just over a square meter of surface area. Now it doesn't sound like a lot, and it isn't relatively, but because the holes couldn't be plugged, about 1,400 litres of Atlantic Ocean water rushed in every second. That means that since you started watching this video, that would mean that over half a million litres would have flooded into the ship. Now that's the equivalent weight of about 50 London double-decker buses. Remember when we talked about water displacement and buoyancy? Well, when Titanic started flooding, there was a very clear, early, ominous sign that something was very wrong. The ship's crew could actually hear air being forced out of a vent on the forecastle deck at the bow of the ship. Now this vent led right down into a tank at the bottom of the ship that would usually be empty, except that the vent was making a hissing sound after the collision with the iceberg as air was being forced out of it, obviously being replaced by rushing water from deep down below. It was the sound of Titanic literally losing her buoyant force as about 1400 litres of water rushed in every second. It happened slowly, but it happened steadily. Titanic had started flooding around midnight and by 2.10am the ship had sunk so far down that that delicate balance of equilibrium was totally lost, there wasn't enough buoyant force left, and the ship's bow plunged down quickly, bringing the rest of the stern eventually with it. But it doesn't just take an impact with an object at sea to allow water in. One unlucky ocean liner, the Italian Principessa Mafalda, was steaming off Brazil in 1927 when the ship's own propeller was thrown violently off its shaft and cut a series of holes in the shell plating. Watertight doors couldn't be fully closed, and the onrush of water allowed the ship to sink, and within four hours she was gone with about 324 of her passengers. It had never hit a single thing. Collisions with other ships are an obvious danger to vessels because, unlike a bumping grating impact that can create small holes that make the ship sink over the course of hours like Titanic, collisions through history have often opened up huge portions of the ship suddenly and without warning. The Empress of Ireland was rammed by a coal-carrying freighter named Storstad, whose bow had been reinforced against thick ice flows. The impact left a monstrous hole in the Empress, some 25 feet or 8 metres deep, and 14 feet or 5 metres wide. 227,000 litres of water rushed in every second, compared to Titanic's 1,400. It meant that the Empress of Ireland's buoyancy force was lost within minutes, and the ship sank just 14 minutes after having been rammed. Torpedoes and bombs can have a very similar effect. The German cruise ship Wilhelm Gustloff was hit with three torpedoes at the end of the Second World War that opened up probably an even bigger amount of the ship's hull to the ocean, and she was gone within the hour with a staggering 9,000 lives lost at the very least. Now aside from having the hull punctured, there are other ways that ships can be lost. Massive, raging storms have been known to take ships down with no warning whatsoever. Following seas are a particularly bad situation. With the waves coming from directly behind, the ship's streamlined shape can cause it to ride the waves like a surfboard, over and over again, 
until one wave comes along that picks the ship up and causes it to swoop and nosedive downwards and overturn with its side to the wave, a situation known as broaching two. With the ship overturned in the waves, water can enter not through the hull, but from all those exposed windows, cargo hatches and doorways on the upper decks. It's thought that the passenger steamer Waratah, which disappeared in 1909, was lost in a storm when a wave caused her to capsize thanks to its top-heavy and unstable construction. The passengers and crew, caught completely off guard, would have stood no chance of escape, and the ship would have been lost in just minutes. Now some ship sinkings have actually been complicated or delayed by the presence of rocks or shallow shoals. In 1918, the small passenger steamer Princess Sophia was caught in bad weather en route from Alaska to Vancouver. The ship was enveloped in a blind caused by heavy snowfall and was unfortunately driven straight into a dense reef of jagged rocks. Now this obviously would have torn holes in the ship's plating as the iceberg had done with the Titanic. But the ship sat high and dry, with all of its crew and passengers on board alive and well, resting atop the reef. But rescue ships couldn't get to them, as heavy winds drove the waves up higher and higher. Attempts at lowering lifeboats proved hopeless, because the boats would likely be smashed against the jagged rocks if they even tried. Stuck high and dry, Princess Sophia's complement knew they had to wait the wild weather out. But then they couldn't help but notice the tide slowly begin to creep in. They'd run aground, and with the tide at its lowest, the ship was entirely out of the water. But as that tide began to rise, the water got higher and higher, until eventually the ship floated clean off the reef, and then Archimedes' principles and the rules of buoyancy took effect. The holes made by the reef caused the water to roar in, and the ship, now no longer supported by the reef, sank completely. With conditions preventing any chance of a rescue, the entire ship's complement, passengers and crew, were lost even though shore and rescue vessels were plainly and agonizingly within sight. Of course, other more catastrophic and sudden events have caused ships to be lost. Magazine detonations have haunted warships since first they set to sea carrying explosives. Now many warships from history have been lost in enormous explosions, with one such famous incident being the Japanese super battleship Yamato. The largest warship ever constructed at 65,000 tons displacement at 263 meters or 862 feet in length. Just one of Yamato's gun turrets weighed as much as an entire US Navy destroyer. Now Yamato was mercilessly hunted down by American aircraft and received no fewer than 11 torpedo and 6 bomb hits. Crippled and slowly flooding, the order was given to abandon ship. The pumping station used to flood the magazines and the forward battery had been knocked out of action and a raging fire caught up to them. The tons and tons of powder detonated in a spectacular explosion that blasted the mighty Japanese battleship apart, sending a dense mushroom cloud more than 6 kilometers or 3.7 miles into the sky. With such a catastrophic blast, the ship's hull was immediately sunk. The effects of buoyancy loss were, to put it simply, greatly expedited. Now one last interesting sinking cause is worth highlighting. Fire. Now, you'd not think fire could cause a ship to sink, and truth be told, unless it caused a rupture in the ship's hull because of the warping effects of heat, then the ship wouldn't necessarily be in immediate danger of sinking. But, weirdly, attempts at putting the fire out could sink the ship instead. The great French ocean liner Normandy was being converted into a troop ship when she caught fire in New York Harbour. Now, over the objections of the ship's designer Vladimir Yorkovich, who just happened to be at hand, tons and tons of river water was pumped in from hydrants to try to stem the blaze. The fire was partially put out, but with nobody aboard to control the flow of the firefighting water, and with too much having been pumped aboard in the first place, the ship's buoyancy and balance equations were thrown out of whack, and she began to slowly roll over until she settled pathetically onto her side. There are at the end of the day, countless ways that ships can sink, but they all boil down to those basic principles that Archimedes outlined some 2,000 years ago. Now, safety standards of modern passenger ships have ensured the danger of a sinking is far lesser, but as humankind has been reminded time and time again, there is simply no such thing as an unsinkable ship. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy. And I'll see you again next time.